should just take a few seconds for that to update. And it looks like it has. We are now live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Chris's Speaker's Corner. This is an actual live stream, and I'm very aware I don't do many of those these days. But we have a very special guest with us. We have Saint Murad, who has been producing his own Quran translation as a native Arabic speaker, as someone who was uh, once a Muslim, now is an ex-Muslim, now is a Christian. He has gone through the Arabic text, the Quran, and he has translated it in such a way that it totally bypasses the sin, the standard Islamic narrative, and it gets to the heart of what the actual text really says in a much more literal sense rather than paraphrasing or taking uh, efforts to change the meaning here and there. So, um, yeah, thank you for being here, Murad. Would you like to give a brief introduction? I hope I did a semi-good job there, at just the very basics. But is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, thank you for having me, Chris. This is a very good opportunity to talk with you. Just a, a minor uh, change to what you have said. I am an ex-Muslim, and now I am a theist, so I believe in God. But you could say maybe not a Christian yet. I'm, <laughs> I'm still looking into it. So this is just for uh, the people so that... Uh, they know what's uh, going on so this is the first Lord thing and one day <laughs> yeah <laughs> so the presentation tonight will be about the sin the standard islamic narrative and why it is wrong and how the standard islamic narrative understanding actually corrupts a quran translation because all the quran translations take this into uh, account for fact so uh, this is what i will talk about tonight Sounds great. Um, I'm aware you've got a presentation for us. Um, if you want to dive straight in, Moret, I'm happy to get into that if you want to present your screen. Yeah, I am sharing now. So, yep, we got it. That's it. Yeah, we can see full it. screen. Yep, that's all good. Okay, so the standard Islamic narrative, or as I call it, the standard Islamic hoax, and uh, people will know why I call it this way. What is the standard Islamic narrative? Well, you have the exegesis of the Quran, you have the hadith, you have the biography of Muhammad, you have Azbab al nuzul which is like reasons for dissension. This is like the literal meaning of the word, but people, uh, they translate it as uh, why the verses the, were revealed or something like that. And you have the Mecca and Medina phases. So uh, verses which were in Mecca, verses which were in Medina. My question is, is this stuff valid to crack the Quran so that we know exactly what the Quran is talking about? Well, is it a Persian Quran? If I were to give you a Spanish book and ask you to explain it in detail, do you think it would be a good idea to ask someone who knows Spanish? This is a question for you, Chris. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, if you gave me a Spanish book, uh, yeah, I'd like to think that the person who explains it is familiar with Spanish. Yeah. All right, then. Why, when it comes to the Quran, you ask someone who does not know Arabic? I am talking about Al-Tabari, Al-Baghawi, and most of the famous translators. They were from Persia. They didn't speak very good Arabic. Most of them were Persians who didn't know Arabic well. This is why the exegesis of the Quran in most verses is laughable. Back in 2020, I made a video on uh, Islamic Origins uh, channel with Mel, proving that the Umayyads and the Abbasids might actually have been from Central Asia. And in all the depictions of early Muslims, you will find them looking Asian. And this is something in the Arab mindset, they do not like that very much. What is the caliph role in all of this? This is a question no one asks. We are not 100% sure of the motives of the caliphs. A lot of politics were, was going on. And the caliphs used to decide how you would uh, explain this verse, how you would explain this hadith. Uh, nothing like this could go without the caliphs' consent. 
So why even listen to them? Because it is a general Islamic consensus. I think this is a bad idea. Back to the Persians. Ironically, the Quran is the only book where if you want to know the meaning of a word, you'd never open a dictionary. Instead, you go to these Persians who never uh, lived in the same century as Muhammad, nor were Arabs, nor lived close to the Hijaz. And the main problem with these interpretations is that they are built on flimsy reports. This guy said to this guy said to this guy, as you know, in the uh, how the Islamic chain is, is going. Mm -hmm. Who are these people? Why should I base my Quran translation on these tafsirs that are clearly a big sham? So I will ask you at this point, what do you think so far? Yeah, um, I think the the idea that people later could sort of narrate what actually happened is is very unlikely given that it's so uh it's both political from the abbasids and the umayyads time but it's also um it's also obviously trying to explain things like uh, there, there are verses in the quran many of them which just don't make any sense right there's there's no context to them in fact there's entire stories that have no context to them so there's obviously a need to look at those surahs that have no context and to give them one so i always find that suspicious when it when it's used more to explain something that in and of itself is just not giving you any information um i think it's very easy for someone to interject new information if there's no actual established context uh whereas yeah with with these guys the umayyads and the abbasids uh, like you say they're persian so I guess like Arabic wouldn't have been their native first language, but like a second language they pick up, I guess, or, or something like that. Would that be right? Yeah, and I can also recall that there was a uh, an Abbasid caliph, maybe he was the fifth or sixth caliph, that he couldn't speak Arabic at all. And this is from the Islamic narrative. He only spoke Persian. And also I remember that there is a report from a Western source talking about Harun al-Rashid, one of the Abbasids, and they call him the, the king of Persia, not the caliph, not the king of Arabia, Persia. So these mm. people, they were Persians, and this is their depictions all over. If you look at the earliest depiction of Harun al-Rashid, you will find he looks Asian. He doesn't look like uh, uh, Saladin in uh, the Kingdom of Heaven movie. This is something that we yeah. that we think of today. That is interesting. They, yeah. We, we often forget just how much we think about the the Arabic uh, invasion of the Middle East, and we kind of think of it as Arabizing completely. You know, like one minute the Middle East is not Arab, next minute it is with the invasion uh, of Umar or whoever it was. But we forget that there's obviously already established cultures there, and it doesn't just disappear overnight. So Islam and the caliphs and the Umar, they, they all have to merge with these cultures. And it's, it's kind of interesting trying to figure out exactly what role that had. Yeah, exactly. But uh, as you can see in this presentation, I am looking into the Quran and how all of this actually corrupted the Quran one way or another because the Quran, uh, it emerged from a different place than from these tafsirs so it made these very big mistakes now what is the sin quran translation standard islamic narrative quran translation an overarching theme in quran exegesis is anything the commentators do not know the meaning of in the quran they actually put it into the afterlife because they know that no one can come back to life and prove them wrong this is a very sleazy marketing tactic an example would be the word kawthar in Surah 108, verse 1. They do not know what does this word mean. They say it is a river in paradise. This is pure comedy because, of course, this word has a Syriac meaning and it means something like uh, a lot of praying, abundance in praying the way that the monks do. But because this word is not Arabic, it's Syriac, they do not know so they used their persian understanding to get closer to it 
and they say it's just a river in paradise, which of course <laughs> you cannot prove it. That's really interesting because I'm aware of this this particular verse because it's often used to claim that Muhammad knew he was going to be in paradise when he dies because supposedly they they will even though Muhammad isn't there in the text his name is not mentioned there they'll say that this is about Muhammad and since it references rivers in paradise this must mean that Muhammad knew he was going to get into Jannah um but that's interesting knowing that there's actually a big issue with the very translation itself yeah, the translators, they're using the sin because they do not have any other uh, alternative. Yeah. But what's, yeah. But, yeah, but that's the reality is that Kawthar is a Syriac word that has nothing to do with a river in paradise. Interesting. And also they say the phrase, the people of knowledge differed about this issue, about everything. When you ask today's Arabic-speaking Muslim apologists, why do Muslim commentators differ about every single issue in the Quran? They will say something like, this is because this is the mercy of Islam, or some stuff like this, which of course is uh, very funny and uh, <laughs> yeah. very illogical. <laughs> it's very uh, fluffy language, right? You know, it's emotional language. This is the beauty of Islam, or this is Islam. okay, sure. Yeah, and of course you have uh, uh, a lot of uh, experience in Speaker's Corner and you have seen this stuff over and over again. But this comes from the tafsirs, it comes from the exegesis. It, this uh, fallacious uh, mindset comes from the standard Islamic narrative. So this is not because, uh, this is because, sorry, the Islamic exegesis is so ignorant about the Quran. This is the reality. That's why they say such weird stuff. They do not have access to the Bible. They do not have access to uh, Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, all of this stuff. They were from Persian background, Zoroastrian background, and they didn't know what they were talking about, actually. So just to jump in, um, so I'm aware that we, when we talk about people like uh, Bukhari, I know Bukhari is much later and he's Hadith side of things. But he was like he was born in Uzbekistan or modern day Uzbekistan, if I remember correctly. So yes, it kind of yes. goes to show you that some of the greatest thinkers and scholars in Islam are actually based quite far away in very different cultures. Uh, so I think I think like uh, in Bukhari's case, he actually does move closer. I think he moves to like modern day Iraq. Um, but yeah, these people come from very different cultures that aren't so close to the events. And they're trying to learn things as they go by, especially in Bukhari's case, when he's trying to figure out what did Muhammad say and what did Muhammad not say. Uh, you know, being hundreds, if not thousands of miles away is probably not a good starting position to find yourself in. Yeah, in this presentation, I will also talk about Bukhari. But for now, what I want to tell the people is that it's a very good idea to detach the Quran from anything that came after it. Not because I am a Quranist, uh, like some people are Quranists, they want to save the Quran. No, this is not the idea. The idea is that now we know that the Quran came from further north, from areas around Syria, Palestine, uh, areas like this. We know this from the text. But Bukhari and uh, Al-Tabari and uh, these exegesis, they came from the east. So they are not really related. This is something that we take for granted today. And actually, it was finalized during the Ottoman times. So this is something that I will show after a while. So just this reply is very stupid or absurd. The reply that uh, this is because the mercy of Islam, that they differed about every single issue. Even Qulhu Allahu Ahad, which is say that Allah is one, they differ about the issue. Just to jump in, Murad. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Hannah Summer, thank you very much for the donation. Uh, means a lot to me. Thank you very, very much. And uh, yes, I'm glad you can, uh, anyone who's looking, I have actually pinned the link to Murad's crime translation into English. She's also uh, got one that includes both an English translation and an Arabic translation, if I'm, if I'm right there, Murad. And yeah, exactly. Yep, there's now a link that is pinned. If you guys want to check that out, you can get it at his uh, Buy Me A Coffee store. 
Okay, so another overarching theme in all these tafsirs or exegesis of, of the Quran is the phrase Allahu A'lam, meaning Allah is more knowledgeable, fraudulently translated by the way as Allah knows best. Actually, it's Allah is more knowledgeable, Allahu A'lam. Why do they use this phrase? It is not because they are humble. It is because they really do not know what the Quran is talking about. I mean, picture this. Someone says, excuse me, where is the near Starbucks? And the other guy will say, well, basically, there are, there are nine, nine opinions. He will say, you, <laughs> sir, you, sir, you are crazy. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> but the same guy, he could ask me, where is the nearest Starbucks? 61 Ninth Avenue. This would be my response. Why? Because I could actually trace uh, the words I use in my Quran translation to the actual dictionary and to Syriac and to Aramaic. So this is a very different thing than the, uh, the usual Quran exegesis. So now we will shift gears a little bit if you want to interject or I could continue. So we'll talk about the Sunnah. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, keep keep going. Okay, so the Sunnah, it came actually from Transoceania, not Arabia. Here are al sihah al sitta the six Sihah. Al-Bukhari, Al-Nisapuri, Al-Qazwini, Al-Ash'ath, Tirmidhi, al nasai So these people, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Majah, these people, the Sihah al sitta where was Al Bukhari born? Place of birth, Uzbekistan. Nisapuri. Hey, I was right. <laughs> yeah. Nisapuri from Nisapur, Iran. Al Qazwini, Iran. Just the name Al Qazwini, it means the Caspian. So he's from the Caspian Sea. Oh. Al Ash'ath, Iran. Al Tirmidhi, Uzbekistan. Uh, Al Nasai, Turkmenistan. So. These people, they were born very far from where the Prophet of Islam supposedly uh, appeared. Let's pinpoint these places on a map. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran. And here is the Persian Gulf and uh, uh, the Caspian Sea. So you can see it's very far east. No one is from Arabia. Plus, oral traditions survive at the same area it was born in, like the indigenous people of America. And since all Sunnah writers came from places other than Arabia, then the claim of oral traditions being passed down from Muhammad uh, is actually fraudulent. Yeah. It would be like if... Um... If you heard someone like narrate something that had an American uh, grammar, but you've never been to America and you're like a uh, thousand miles away, you're in Germany or something, it would be very strange to think that you've accurately got that translation that can go all the way back to a person if you've never been there and the person lived like 100 or 200 years ago. Exactly. So this is exactly the point. So it's not just that it's like Chinese whispers game. No, also there is a problem with geography. So here I ask the question, is Sahih al-Bukhari a hoax? Sahih al-Bukhari doesn't have one original manuscript. This Moroccan scholar called Rashid Eilal wrote a whole book about it. Until now, no one debunked him. The name of the book, Sahih al-Bukhari Nihayat Ustura. In English would be, Sahih al-Bukhari, the end of a myth, and this book is printed in Arabic. Debunking him requires one thing and one thing only, a manuscript from the time of al-Bukhari, or even close. That never happened. Muslim scholars uh, created a pseudoscience called Ilm al-Rijal, or the science of men. Actually, this is hocus pocus, because they cannot trace the tradition back to Muhammad. So what about the others, Sahih Muslim and the rest of the Sahih Sitta? Well, their case is even worse than Bukhari, as explained again by this 
Moroccan scholar in his book. Plus, these writings in Bukhari are not all about Muhammad. You have the example of the Shi monkey getting stoned. <laughs> Where is Muhammad in the story? <laughs> and I ask you, what do you think so far? <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully he's not the Shi monkey, I guess, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, this, is, this is really interesting. I have not heard of this guy before. Um, do you know if his works have been translated into English or is his book just purely in Arabic at the moment? No, it's just in Arabic and people, they're oh. only cursing him. They're saying he's an infidel, but they never read the book. He is saying, guys, please show me just one manuscript that's even close to the time of Bukhari. Yeah, I'd love to read this, but obviously I'm going to need some kind of translation. But yeah, that's, that is amazing. I, I am aware of the manuscript problem with... Bukhari, you know, he has these Sahih works that he produced with all the most authentic hadith and all the ones that he didn't write down that he destroyed, which I find very suspicious and uh, difficult to accept. But the idea that we don't even have a manuscript that goes back to that time, and at this point, this is the ninth century, so it should be pretty easy to get a manuscript, you would think, but nothing there. Hmm. Yeah, uh, this man, because of course I didn't put all the details in this uh, presentation, but in his book he says, the very first uh, like an equivalent to one volume of Bukhari, appears in the Middle Ages, and the finalized version of Bukhari is actually at the time of World War One. <laughs> you see? <laughs> World this War is, One? Wow. Yes. Where you have the entire Bukhari. So, so I have yeah. something maybe that's related to this because I learned probably about a month ago now. Uh, I was reading Gabriel Reynolds' book, um, The Quran and the Bible, and he basically, not too far into it, he actually explains. So you have uh, Hafs and Asim, which is like the most common Quran for anyone who doesn't know. That's basically 95% of any Quran you pick up. Well, supposedly there's four different traditions of Hafs and Asim. And depending on, and you basically, you, in 1924, when they had the, the Cairo project to standardize the Quran and then distribute it, um, they had to pick which of these four uh, chains of Hafs to go with because they differ slightly. And I couldn't believe it because I was thinking, this is 1924. You know, so like that's almost 1,600 or 1,500 years have passed. You would have thought they would have ironed all this stuff out centuries ago and came to some sort of consensus over what Hafs, what his version of the Quran actually is. But it was still up for debate. And I, find, I find that just so fascinating. I wonder if that's a similar thing here that, you know, it, it took this long for people to actually finally settle on, okay, this is what this is like the definitive Bukhari work <laughs> and anything else is not authentic. Yeah, with the, with the Sunnah. The case is almost similar to the Quran. Wow. That's the idea. Everything was finalized during the Ottoman times with World War I. This is the, the reality of things. This is the manuscripts that we have, either for Sunnah or, as you are talking about the Quran, for Hafsas. Uh, they had the problem in Egypt with uh, the exams because they differed a little bit. Here and there, and Egypt had followed Hafs, although before it followed Warsh, which followed uh, Morocco. But then they went with Saudi Arabia and followed Hafs. So this is what's going on. They they didn't have the final decision till World War One. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, really. So bizarre. So now we will move to. Uh, the biography of Muhammad. It is another sin standard Islamic narrative hoax. This is the picture of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, and this is an Abbasid Caliph. I think this is the second Abbasid Caliph. Also, this is the oldest depiction of him as a Central Asian guy the cent with the Asian clothes, Asian features. Al-Mansur, the second Abbasid Caliph, is the one who requested from Ibn Ishaq to write the biography of Muhammad for his son Al-Mahdi. And this comes from the Islamic tradition, by the way. I'm not making this up. Ibn Ishaq wrote this biography 
130 years after Prophet Muhammad's supposed death. Now, what is the problem? Problem is the original of Ibn Ishaq is lost. The original of Al Bakai, which took from Ibn Ishaq, is lost. The original of Ibn Hisham, which took from Ibn Ishaq, is lost. Robert Spencer's Did Muhammad Exist shows very well the problems with the biography of Muhammad, and Crossroads to Islam shows exactly how the archaeology actually leads to Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. So, this is the sin uh, biography of Muhammad, very problematic. And uh, of course, if you are a caliph and you ask someone to write a biography for your son, you will write something like Peter Pan, something like King Arthur. You will you will automatically write something that has fiction because your son wants to hear marvelous stories. So just the beginning of how they wrote the biography of Muhammad is problematic. And I ask you, what do you think so far? Yeah. Um, I, I have a very low opinion of the biography of Muhammad. I think a lot of it is embellished. Uh, a lot of it has probably been destroyed intentionally. Um, I think that was the whole idea behind the science of Hadith. It's to basically categorize what people want there to be about Muhammad that's useful in terms of his biography and to get rid of anything that's embarrassing like Muhammad reciting satanic verses uh, and so on and so forth. And they came up with a criteria to be able to do it. Um, I haven't read Robert Spencer's Did Muhammad Exist? Um, I have his critical Quran, but I don't have this book. And I'm aware he's just published another book, uh, which is also about the... Actually, I think it's a critical biography of Muhammad that Robert Spencer's just made, uh, just released. Um, and I need to get that as well. But yeah, I, I'm completely with you. Um, I didn't realize we didn't have Ibn Hisham. Um, so that's interesting to learn as well. Yeah, Ibn Hisham, the original we do not have. We have small fragments from him. And about uh, Robert Spencer, actually, did Muhammad exist? Goes very well with his new book. Because in his new book, he shows that almost every single thing we know about Muhammad, it has multiple versions that are not just contradictory, but they are contradictory like crazy. For example, when was he born? They could say he was born at the year of the elephant, or five years before the year of the elephant, or 15 years after the year of the elephant. So this kind of discrepancy is just too much. Also, who was the angel who visited him first? Was it Gabriel? Was it always Gabriel? No, there are versions that it was Seraphil and then Gabriel. Was it real or was it a dream? Also, you have two versions within the oh, standard wow. Islamic narrative. Hmm. And I think it's important to highlight that when you have those variants that contradict each other, Islam is fundamentally these these variants these these hadith these these traditions that always supposedly go back to muhammad but because there's differing accounts they can't all be true so for them in there is you know islam as a whole when you take into account the hadith they have tons of variants and tons of contradictions they just don't think of it that way because they sort of make the quran the the amazing thing that's perfectly pure and then everything else which is what they rely on they just go oh that's you know that's that's not the quran it's fine but really, no, that is that is your revelation because that's that's your entire religion. If you don't have the Hadith, you don't have the Sunnah, you don't have anything. So yeah, it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, exactly. So now we will move to Asbab al-Nuzul, which is, they translate in English, why was this verse revealed? But actually, the literal meaning is verses flying down from heaven, as you can see here in this picture. This is Asbab al nuzul But of course, Muslim translators, they always have it as, why was this verse revealed? Reality is that this is a highly narcissistic, self-centered approach to the Quran, later created by Muslims after owning a complete Quran. On one level, it is made to cover up the fact that they do not know what the Quran is actually saying. And on a deeper level, it was crafted to forge the life of Muhammad into the Quran. When in reality, the Quran does not know Muhammad. And of course, this might be a new theory to you, but I have talked before about the four mentions of Muhammad in the Quran. 
they could actually be a reference to Jesus because Muhammad means the most praised and just the the way of saying Muhammad the one who is praised is kind of a divine title you cannot have this title if you are just a mere human and people could say well uh, the Quran mentions Isa well also the Quran when it talks about uh, for example uh, Yunus which is Jonah it says Jonah and it also calls him the Noon which is the one of the whale so no problem the, the problem the Quran uses multiple names for a single person what I'm saying is that the Quran is detached from Muhammad and the whole idea of Muhammad was added later to the Quran by the Abbasids I'm just going to jump in and say I, I very much agree um, you've obviously done a much bigger dive into this than I have and obviously having translated the Quran you have a much bigger uh, scope of this than I do but from what I have looked into those four references uh, especially when one of the references because there's a reference that talks about jesus in a particular way uh, i think it's something like uh isa is is like a messenger or something like that and, and just a messenger and there's another verse that supposedly is about muhammad but it's basically the exact same as a previous verse that talked about isa and i remember when you when you look at that you think oh wow yeah that that looks like it's a very easy case to make that that was originally actually about jesus as well but was changed so uh, yeah exactly and also someone told me well uh, there is a surah called muhammad in the quran what are you talking about i tell him uh, you should look at the names of the surahs because the original manuscripts they did not have surah names also look at your own tradition because this surah it used to be called surah al-qital meaning the surah of combat not the surah of muhammad this is a later renaming of the surah and actually a lot of surahs in the quran are renamed and this is within the islamic tradition and there are books remember when hatun showed the 37 qurans there yeah. are other qurans with different surah names and they are very critical because just the changing of the name shows uh, what was being done to manipulate the text Oh wow! I did not know. I did not know you could still get them like different Arabic Qurans with different surah names. That's that's interesting. One okay. uh, one has Surah Seventeen as Surah of the Children of Israel, not Surah Night Journey, because it is about the children of Israel. It's about Moses. It has nothing to do with Muhammad. And this I have a photographic evidence in the in one Quran which actually has it as Bani Israel, not Surah Night Journey. So this is a very uh, powerful example, you see? Yeah, that, that is amazing. Wow. So now we will move to Mecca and Medina. I ask Mecca or Medina or Muhammad and Moses. The sin standard Islamic narrative claims that some these verses or surahs, they were revealed in Mecca, while these were in Medina. Reality is Muhammad immigration his immigration from Mecca to Medina is a hoax. It is remodeled on Moses' exodus with his people out of Egypt for being persecuted for their new monotheism. The details of this scam are not to be discussed here, but I have made a long video with Jay Smith talking exactly about how this was done. And in reality, they never used the word hijri for dating the Arabs. If you look at the uh, Muawiyah and uh, how they used to to date, they say according to the years of the Arab, the year of the Arab, not the years of the Hijra. The word Hijra came close to the medieval times. So uh, it's also new, this Hijra idea. Also the Yathrib, it was renamed to Medina in the medieval times. You see? Interesting. Yeah. So this is another sin standard Islamic narrative hoax to make the Quran fit the story of Muhammad. Adding insult to injury, no one actually agrees which verses are Meccan and which are Medinan. And sometimes half of the verses in Mecca and half is in Medina. Again, <laughs> picture this. 
I am in Mecca. I told you something like, hey man, let's go grab some. And after two to four weeks of traveling, I tell you, coffee. <laughs> what is this? I've always wondered. It's, it is kind of because I've heard that, you know, he said a little bit of the Surah in Mecca and then he said the rest of it in Medina. Or sometimes it's even more like this little bit in Mecca, this little bit in Medina. Then, and it, it gets quite strange in thinking on, on why revelation would come that way. But yeah, this, <laughs> this is a funny uh, illustration about how, how it's all split up like that. Yeah, so uh, the, the easier explanation is that this is just a lie. Yeah, I, I do think uh, I, I would agree that we should probably discount the, the Mecca and the Medinian uh, dis distinction in the Quran because it isn't helpful. Yeah, so here there are things that are not mentioned in the Quran at all. And this is for the Western audience so that they they are not fooled one way or another. Hijra, specifically from Mecca to Medina, this is not in the Quran. Isra and Ma'raj, which is fraudulently translated as the night journey, it is not in the Quran. You do not have these words. Well, yes, you have them, but you have them here and there. You do not have them together, uh, implying that there was a night journey for Muhammad to the seven heavens. It's not there. The doctrine of abrogation, it is not there. The word nasakha in my translation does not mean abrogate. How can I know? I will show you in this presentation. The black stone, not mentioned. Ashura, Muhammad's wives. Well, yes, but maybe if uh, if you say that he is Muhammad, but of course it is not mentioned clearly at all. It's just mentioned as the messenger. And this messenger, in a lot of cases, it's the angel, angel messenger. Muhammad's companions, never mentioned. Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, five pillars of Islam, and many, many more. These things come from the sin standard Islamic narrative. And back to you, what do you think? Like this is so important because these points you've got on the screen, these are all the central beliefs basically of Islam. I mean, even the five pillars itself is is here, and it's completely right. Like I've always thought that strange that so little of Islam actually comes from the Quran. Like so little of it. Um, the so yeah, Israel and Miraj. Um, I've met countless Muslims that try and say the Miraj is in the Quran, but they. They can never find it. Um, they're usually just referring to Surah 17, and they, they just haven't read it properly. Um, but yeah, it, it really makes you think, just when you strip everything away, the Quran is like a totally different book from what we've been led to think it actually is. Yeah, and as you can see also, uh, people, they make a lot of debates, Christian and Muslims. The Muslims, they always say something like, show me the Trinity in the Bible. I will tell him the word Tawheed is never mentioned in the Quran. That's even better. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, so so I have my own version of this. Uh, my yeah. one is show me uh, the doctrine of, of Isma, the, the supposed sinlessness of the prophets. Like, show me where this is in the Quran. Because, Isma, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, forgive me. I, I have to guess with these words, you know, uh, as an Englishman. No, no, no problem. <laughs> but... um. So, and they never can. And I say, look, you know, I'll show you where the Trinity is in black and white as soon as you show me where this doctrine is mentioned. And of course, it, it's not only that they can't find it in the Quran, they also can't really find it in the Hadith either. It, it's it's such a, like a, a, just this thing that's just come out of nowhere. It doesn't come from the Quran or the Sunnah. And what's worse is the Quran in, in many different places explicitly says that prophets did do things that were sinful or did do things that were against God's uh, God's will. You know, uh, so so it's such a, bizarre doctrine to try to defend when everything in your religious scripture says the opposite uh, that, that's the one i go to but you're right there's, there's a ton of these a lot of people go to uh tawhid or explicitly where jesus says or Is, uh, isa says he was a prophet um where it says to pray five times a day uh the shahada in the exact formula yeah all, all these kind of things yeah, and the word Tawheed, if you translate it literally in the correct way, it means unification, not unity, not oneness. And uh, just from this word, you could actually uh, trace back Islam that it might have been a Christian heresy. It might, been, uh, might have been Arianism in a new clothing 
just by cracking this word tawheed which is unification so islam doesn't have anything about unity or oneness it's just unification with unification you need the minimum of two things it could be three so this is something that they never think about interesting i say enough is enough the sin doesn't have holes in it it's just one big hole like dr j smith always says you've got the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time even muslim scholar yasir qadi he acknowledges this when he says that the standard islamic narrative has holes in it don't worry i will barbecue the sin on my channel if people are interested they could uh, subscribe so the sin i say it is a hoax these tools they are not valid to crack the quran if you want to know exactly what the weird verses in the quran are saying you cannot use such material which came way too late way too far you would need to look at material which came before the quran actually the quran itself says Is'alu ahlik dhikr in kuntum la ta'lamun, which would be ask the people of the remembrance if you did not know and by the remembrance if you see this word in all the quranic context you will find that this is the torah which would be uh, the jewish scriptures it's telling you talk to a rabbi talk to a priest because they know these stories they are the ones who will crack me as the quran that's what it's saying but of course muslims today they will tell you ask the imam there was no imams there was no shiuch this is just a new invention that uh, came much much later and now i will ask you what do you think so far because i will go to the muslim and non-muslim uh, quran translations yeah absolutely loving this this is uh really really good stuff yeah let's let's keep going okay now the question with the bible usually is which translation is better but with the quran the question is which translation is worse Quran translations are so bad and deceptive that there is an online meme they say this is the science of bracketology because in the Quran you have more brackets than you have the actual text because they could never give you the bare Quran because you will know that it doesn't mention Muhammad so they have to keep shoving him in there now what did these translators have before translating the Quran so you have Muslim translators and you have Christian translators like Robert Spencer and Osama Dakdok Osama I love of course and this has nothing to do with the with his translation it's just that I am saying we used very different methodology they used the sin standard Islamic narrative to translate the Quran to crack the code the Quran is the only book in history in which when you want to translate it you never open a dictionary but you go to writings written by Persians who are way too late and way too far Muslim and non-Muslim Quran translators started by translating from Surah 1 without creating their own concordance this is evident from their lack of consistency in word choice in reality the Quran is very poor in vocabulary so when you read it in english you will find you will feel that uh, it has very rich vocabulary when this is not the case here we will look at how the sin corrupts a quran translation this is the famous verse which is about uh, abrogation it says Ma nansakhu min ayatin aw nunsiha. Nansakh, they say abrogate almost every single quran translation uses the word abrogate a verse this is said because if you look at the same word it's mentioned four times in the quran nansahu and here akhadha al-alwah fi nuskhatiha fayansahu nastansikh four mentions the arabic word nasakha has a common theme in all these contexts did they know the common theme no they didn't that's why here they will say abrogate and here they will say transcribe and here they will say write and all of this stuff 
Why? Because they didn't create their own concordance. They didn't put a lot of effort and time to see exactly what this word means. I say it is not abrogation. People will find this in my translation. They will be shocked from my translation, of course. Ayah is not a verse. The Quran doesn't have the word verse. This comes from their obsession with the Bible. Let me tell you, Muslim translators are obsessed with the Bible. And I said this in another presentation. They have this biblical language in their mind and they superimpose it on the Quran. The Quran is not the Bible. It doesn't use the word sin. It doesn't use the word verse. It doesn't use these religious words. It uses other language, more secular language, more uh, business-like, business-oriented language. Very different. Like in the Bible, you have the word recompense. For example, the Quran has in my translation, renumeration or something like paying for a job. This is what the Quran is using business words. Before I move on, I will ask you what do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is this is huge because their whole way of understanding revelation is hinges on Surah 2 106. It, that verse where it talks about uh, things can be abrogated. You know, Allah can reveal one verse and then be like, nah, you know, this was fun for a while, but now I want to bring something equal to it or better than it. And if that really isn't what is meant here, then that has like tsunami waves of, of an impact on the religion of Islam and how people understand it. Yeah, the, the doctrine of abrogation, why it was crafted, it was to open a hole so that you can abrogate the whole of the Quran if you like. So they will say, well, there are hadith that could abrogate a verse in the Quran. Now you are creating a new religion. But in the Quran, this word it does not mean abrogate. Nasakha is making a copy. It is not abrogating. Nasakha make a copy. If I say I have a nuskha, I might have a version. I have a different copy, something along those lines. You see, this has nothing to do with abrogation. This is the doctrine that came later. Yeah. So here again, man ansakhu min ayatin. Here you have Usama Duck Dog translation. You have Robert Spencer and you have uh, Sahih International. You will find that they will say abrogate a verse or revelation. Do you see any difference between Muslim and non-Muslim Quran translations here? Creating more sin-based translations is like beating a dead horse. I'm not talking about Osama or Robert. Osama is a genius in his own way. Robert also is a genius because of his uh, uh, Quran exegesis that he adds. I'm saying that it's not a very good idea to create more sin-based translations. We need to get out of the sin because in my translation, we do not have verse or abrogate. And I have a very powerful case I could show you in every single context why these words are not what the author is intending. For example, here you will have Robert and Osama. They will say jihad means fight the infidels. I say jihad used to mean exert effort. This is without the sin. With the sin, it is holy war or uh, fight the infidels. It's as if they are saying gay only used to mean homosexual, and I am saying, well, in the 50s, that used to mean happy, flamboyant. Now it strictly means homosexual. That's what I'm saying. That's the difference in methodology, the difference. That's what the, the sin is hiding. It's hiding this primitive meaning in the Quran. That's why I say they are oranges and I'm an apple, because... We are different. We're, we just use a different methodology. They are using what Muslims today believe. I am using what uh, the Quranic author may be intended and was lost to the sin. So here, the Muslim translators, the, this camp will say something like the Quran can't be 100% understood, but it is from Allah. And this camp says the Quran cannot be 100% understood because it's from a madman or because it's corrupt, something along those lines. But they are both relying on the sin. 
they are using the wrong tools to crack the Quran. It's like I want to open an iPhone and I get a knife. No, I should get its very specific tools to open it. Here, the Muslim translators, most of the time they are liars. They are trying to make Islam look better. But here, the Christian translators, they are sincere. They say it as it is. They, they try their best to give you what the Quran is actually saying, but using the wrong tools, just like the Muslims here. Now, if I give you white sugar, eggs, baking soda, vanilla, and milk, what will you create? You might create an amazing cake, like the Christian translators. You might create a horrible cake, like the Muslim translators. But in the <laughs> end, in the end, it's a cake because you have the same ingredients, so you will get the same results. Same, same, standard Islamic narrative, same results. So we've got a big problem. What is the solution? Well, a Quran translation that totally ignored the sin and worked with language only, aka the Murat translation. And I will tell the people to stay tuned. If we get to uh, have another live stream, I will tell them exactly how I created this translation. Because sometimes people tell me it's impossible to understand the Quran without the sin. I will tell them why I did it. How do I crack a word? I check it in every single context in the Quran. Then all of a sudden I know what the author meant. I open the dictionary. I open the ancient Arabic poetry. This stuff that is close to linguistics. Muslims, they say Quran is a linguistic miracle, yet they never obsess about linguistics to crack the Quran. They are obsessing about this guy said to this guy said to this guy. It's very weird. And my presentation is done at this point, and now I will get back to you. Wow. Yeah, thank you for that. That was very eye-opening. Uh, I, I, I do very much appreciate that you, with your translation, you're not just taking the standard Islamic narrative that has come to us through generations and generations of Islamic scholars trying to do their best at understanding something that probably can't be uh, understood using their method but rather you go underneath it. You actually look at, well, let's just take the text, take away the exegesis that has been imposed on it and let it speak for itself. And I think there's a ton of value in that. Um, and it's definitely going to be very useful for me in my my polemics and my conversations with Muslims, uh, in particular when we talk about the Quran and what certain things mean. So that's uh, incredibly helpful. Um, I think maybe we could, if you want to Murad we could perhaps have people ask some questions maybe yeah sure what do you sure. think does that sound does that sound good yeah, um, sure. I'm going to go through the chat but uh, if you guys want to start putting any questions you have for, for Murad and uh, I'll pick them up put them on screen and uh, you get a chance to uh, to get Murad to respond so there's this one I think you kind of covered this um but if you just maybe want to talk a little bit more about this Murad. yeah um nothing wrong with uh, robert spencer's quran translation it's just that it's a very different methodology he used the islamic understanding of the text that's what happened so for example he will say uh, you cannot eat swine because this is the muslim understanding of the text in my translation actually the Quran doesn't mention swine or pigs. So Muslims can eat bacon. In my translation, there is no abrogation. Why? Because I used just the linguistic method. So it's very different than the translation of Spencer. Nice. Um, just looking through comments. Trying to see uh, anything I want to bring up. Can't see any questions yet, guys. Oh, wait. No. I think there were some questions a lot earlier in the stream. But it's... Uh, there's a lot of chat. We managed to hit 200 people live at once, which is pretty amazing. Nice. I think I saw someone say that they, they bought your, your Quran translation as well. 
So that's that's really awesome. Thank you to whoever did that. Yeah, that's very nice. If anyone wants to ask me anything regarding this translation, uh, just do it. So, For example, uh, Chris, yeah, I do not have the word Yathrib in my translation. Why? Because I have seen this word mentioned in another context in the Quran, which made it clear that it is not a place. It is just an act. You see? Hmm. How is this different? I do not understand. Jesus is God. Well, in the next expose, where I will show exactly how it I uh, translated uh, my translation, you will see that I used a totally different method. I didn't use the standard Islamic narrative at all. No hadith, no Muhammad, no exegesis. So this yielded much different results. It might get us close to what the Quranic author actually intended. So Human Kirk asks, so when can we expect this new translation? Well, they can buy it now. It's uh, in the link. I think the link is in the chat. But the official expose on my channel will be on the 1st of November. This is if you are skeptic and you just want to see exactly how I did my translation. First, you can check it. But if you want to get it now, just get it from the link in uh, in the chat and in the description. I would encourage you all to do that. I have a copy myself, so I would very much uh, encourage you all to do the same because it is amazing, an amazing translation and very useful for your conversations with Muslims or just for study. Uh, Hannah Summer says, is there a place where we can get your semantic and grammatical explanations? Well, all of that will be in uh, my expose in the, on my channel and uh, in future videos. But in my translation, I do not like add any commentary. And this is something that you will never find. Any Quran translation, you will find very few brackets here and there or some form of commentary. That's because they want to add Muhammad in the mix. So mine, it does not have that. It's just a pure translation. Nice. Uh, Vonnie says, for St. Murad, since your translation ignores abrogation rules, then what does it imply, if not abrogation? And can you give an example? Well, uh, as I am saying, the word nasakha, it means make a copy. It's talking about signs. Ayah is sign. It's not a verse. So it says that the Quran doesn't like duplicate a verse or cause it to be forgot. That's what it's saying. So this is in my translation. And I have uh, the backing of the Arabic dictionary. If you just say Nasakha in the Arabic dictionary. And actually, Chris, there is something very funny. Within the dictionary, it will tell you Nasakha means make a copy or have another version or make a duplicate. But Islamically, it means <laughs> abrogate. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Wow. What is this? You see? <laughs> Um, so we have Prima Scriptura says, what is the best lexicon available English readers can use in reading the Quran? Um, to be honest, uh, I do not think there is one. That's yeah. I, so yeah, I was on this view as well. I know that there has been a lot of difficulty in actually producing a sort of scholarly accepted critical lexicon or even um a concordance uh as such because there's just so little interest in doing it bizarrely um that that's to my knowledge maybe things have changed a little bit but if anyone is aware of some uh, really amazing lexicons uh, i'd love to hear them yeah i have created my own concordance but the it's just like in a very amateur way it's not to be published online but this concordance, it took every single word in the Quran and checked uh, every single context it's mentioned in the Quran. That's why it yielded this much different results. We have 
Hobocop, I think that's how that's meant to be, is the 7th century Arabic missing vowels? If so, how is it possible for words to be mistaken? Yeah, the 7th century Arabic, um, I think it was not Arabic. It was Syriac, but then it got Arabized, and now all of a sudden you have Arabic. Because why would someone write something without vowels? This is crazy. But adding vowels over something which was already uh, good and readable, this is what we can believe. So... Uh, I was just using the huffs, so all these surprises, I have it just using huffs and just ignoring the standard Islamic narrative. Imagine if we also ignored all the vowels and got back to Aramaic and Syriac, then the Quran would be almost 100% correct. Interesting. So you take um, uh, Christopher Luxembourg and... Um... Gontolulik? I can't pronounce his name. I'm not sure if that's right. But do you, do you kind of take their understanding that these were like original Syriac lexicons and they've been uh, sort of like co-opted for an Islamic purpose? Is that kind of your view? or? Yeah. Um, but I did not adopt their understanding in my translation. Now, why is that? Because... A good Quran concordance was never created, so I created my own, just assuming the Quran to be a hundred percent Arabic and not Syriac, so that if I create another translation in the future, now I can all, uh, now I can judge if Christopher Luxembourg has the right word in Syriac because I already have my concordance because Luxembourg could say something now and I could just believe him blindly because I did not do my own homework. So that's why this translation that I have done is critical, because it will serve as a future uh, for another translation which will have the Syriac and Aramaic layer. This is like a, a, a stratas of, uh, in the rock. So the Aramaic strata, you cannot um, work just from the Aramaic strata without doing the, the work with the Arabic. The original Arabic or or the final Arabized, as I say, the final Arabized halves. Hmm. So the question for me, uh Christmas Speaker's Corner, uh, will you read it live for charity? This is Dijan uh, Petro Pre Petrovanik. Probably absolutely butchered your name, so for a very big apologies if I have. Um, possibly. That's that is a good idea. Um, I'm still sort of coming down from reading the Quran in a terrible English translation. I'm not sure if you sh uh, saw Murad, but I read the Quran live for just over 14 hours, just straight. Um, and yeah, uh, the translation I read was also really bad. It was really bad. It, it took so much liberties uh, with the Arabic text. I mean, I'm not an Arab. Uh, I, I don't know Arabic, so, you know, uh, but even I could tell <laughs> they, they were taking some liberties. But we'll see what the future holds for that. Um, cool. I'm going to say we that looks a bit Oh, wait, maybe one more. I saw something for a second. I'm just trying to find it again. Just scrolling through comments. Mm -hmm. uh, can you ask what would be the best online translators website we can use? Well, anything you will have online, it will have the sin understanding. So if that's what you're asking for, I think the the less deceptive one might be Sahih International. It's a little better than Yusuf Ali, a little better than uh, Mustafa Khattab, but they are all just bad. I would go with Osama Dakduk if you want the closest understanding to the sin with uh, the understanding of the Arabic. But just to say, just to tell you, I'm 
I think all these translations are, with the exception of Osama, I think all these translations are horrible. Either Sahih International or Mustafa Khattab or any of these. Nice. So I'm going to show, I'm going to do one more question and then we'll wrap up and we'll call it a show. Uh, Marcel Al Hind says, Brother Saint Murad in Quran 3 7, it says, and then something I do not know. So, why did Allah send this book to us? If only Allah understands it, how can we do an interpretation? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, yeah, the word it says, illallah, which could be, uh, no one knows its interpretation except Allah. And, uh, the Quranic author usually he flexes his muscle. That's what I see. Now, why is that? Because he wants you to be a Muslim, and a Muslim is someone who submits submissively. That's what you will find in the Quran. You have to be submissive, and you do not have any will. So the the Quranic author or Allah is always flexing, even when it says uh, he is the best of deceivers. It's actually flexing. Like, even if you want to deceive, I am even better. <laughs> I am good at good, and I am good at evil. I will beat you in any game. This is the mindset of the Quranic author, because, of course, I have read it multiple times now, and uh, I see that this author, he is kind of a narcissist. So that's what's going on. I think that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us, Samarad. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I've wanted to have you on my channel for quite a while now. Um, I've been incredibly busy with things, but I'm finally glad I managed to to have you on so you could give your, your presentation. I would like to have you back for your second part, if that's good with you. Yeah, yeah, we will uh, definitely arrange the, the timing. Awesome. Yeah, I can't, cannot wait. Well, thanks again for everyone uh, who joined. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing to have you all here. And uh, we will see you in the next one. Take care.